Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, as, uh, as Atul mentioned, I'm um, at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you. Um, and ASCO has been very, uh, actually we did our original, the workforce study that I'm going to present some data from, we did it in, uh, with assistance from the AAMC. They have a workforce center there um, and that collects data and it does a lot of the research. So um, I'm going to show you some of the research that we have, but um, it, it'll go into, it'll, you'll see similar things from other physician specialties as well. Um, but what you're hearing from a tool in terms of the shortages, it's really well backed up by a lot of data on the physician workforce. So definitely want it, um, and, and I'm sure he'd be happy to share all of it for anyone who has the time. <laughs> so I work at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. We represent <coughs> oncologists who, of course, treat cancer patients. And, um, and, uh, and we started this workforce uh, project um, because we were concerned about a lot of the issues that you've already heard. Um, a tool um, and Alicia discuss. But the, I want to emphasize at the outset that the reason we're concerned about a physician shortage isn't, as Alicia said, because we're concerned about doctors having jobs. It's because we're concerned about all the patients, all the people, including me, including all of you, and including people you love, who need medical care. And ultimately, um, Teams are very important, but ultimately a physician is really a, a very important part of that, uh, of delivering medical care. And as you can see, this is another, um, another graphic showing what Atul talked about. We've got an aging of, the US work for, uh, aging of the U.S. population. And these bars are actually, if you can't see the, the very small numbers at the bottom, these bars are just people over the age of 60. So, I mean, the growth trajectory just in the age of everyone over 60, the darkest color is people 60 to 64, and then we've got 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and then 84 plus at the very top. So we have um, really a, a, an outstanding demographic shift in the U.S. that we have to prepare for. And why is cancer concerned about this? Well, if you don't know the information on cancer, and again, sorry about the small numbers here, but these are different. This first row here is all cancer sites. And this is from birth to 70 plus. And it's showing the probability that you will, that someone in these age categories will have cancer. Um, oh, I'm sorry, the folks on the other side of the room. So if, uh, 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 across all cancer sites, cancer is absolutely a disease of the aging. Your probability of cancer goes up. The only cancer site on this graph that that's not the case, this chart that's not the case, is uterine cervix. There's a little bit of bumpiness in this line um, because it's a reproductive and, and hormonal um, driven cancer. But other than that, all the cancers on this chart, your odds go up as uh, your odds of getting cancer increase as you age. So combine that with the previous graph and you'll see why the oncologists were very concerned about whether there would be enough people to treat the, the cancer patients. So <clears throat> in 2007, we did the, our original workforce study with the assistance of the AAMC Workforce Center. And we did the study until uh, we looked over the period of, until 2020. And we found that there would be a shortage of oncologists. And this is driven um, mostly by an increase in demand, which is, actually, is directly related to the slides I just showed you on the aging population. It's also related to the fact, and this is the good news story, that there is an increase in cancer prevalence. So more people are surviving cancer, but then we have cancer survivors, and they need ongoing care. They need to be monitored, and, and there's also a lot of um, probability that they will have a subsequent cancer. So there's a lot of monitoring that goes on. This is our projected growth in supply, 14%. Um, so that's what makes up this difference. The difference between 48% and 14% is what makes up the shortage. Now, the way that ASCO approached this, you know, when we released these findings, we wanted to keep this in the context of cancer care, that it's not just about physicians, because cancer care is a very collaborative um, a delivery system. And so this really is a challenge for the entire oncology care team. And there's also, you've probably also heard about nursing shortages. Um, oncologists work incredibly closely with nursing, nurses. In fact, nurses actually are the ones who administer the chemotherapy treatment. 
So while the physician prescribes the treatment and makes the overall assessment, it's actually the nurses who deliver the chemo. So that's a very, it's a very critical issue facing the whole team. And the other thing that we concluded is it really takes a multifaceted approach to deal with this shortage. And here's just a visual depiction of the shortage. And the reason that these bars are wide is because we're, this is not an exact science by any mean. In fact, an engineer would look at this and, and be shocked. I mean, because there's so much that we don't know. And, and Atul talked about this, you know, the, what, the, what they were predicting when he was in medical school. You know, we have no way of knowing, and now there's, there's therapies going on in cancer that I think you wouldn't have even, you know, heard about. I mean, it's, it's incredible, the transformation. So I want to emphasize that the shortage is we don't project any differences in service delivery or in, um, or in new treatments or therapies or how care is organized. This is pure and simply based on aging of the U.S. population and increase in number of cancer survivors. And I should mention um, the, the incidence and uh, prevalence information was actually developed for us by the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. So we got that information from folks who are really expert in the field. And this is, we, we did model some alternate scenarios. For instance, if there are 50% more slots, you'll see that's uh, this scenario here. That does bring us closer to demand, but obviously 50% more slots is not going to be happening. Um, if people retire later, if there is only 8% more slots, which might be more reasonable, if uh, primary care physicians take on an increased um, role in caring for cancer survivors, but there's actually more of a concern about a primary care shortage. So a lot of these things, there's no single bu magic bullet here. Um, similar to the aging of the U.S. population, we also have an aging of the oncologist's workforce. Um, and this, so fi more than 50 percent, both in 2007 and we've now updated the numbers with 2012, of oncologists are over the age of 50. Um, so this is what's driving the real workforce shortage. And I think there's a, a couple things to note about this. One is just the sheer volume of people. Over 50% of the workforce is going to be retiring. But the other issue is those people who are 50 and over are actually the most productive members of the workforce. You know, when you get out of medical school, the 35 to 49 age range, you're ramping up in your productivity. You're, you're learning how the systems work. You're, um, you know, establishing a client, a patient population. And so really, once physicians have fit, hit, hit 50 is when their productivity is at the max. And so not only are we losing over half of our workforce, we're also losing the most productive members of our workforce. And so that's a, another significant concern. Um, this shows uh, in this graph the switchover that happened in 2008 before um, those who were under the age of 40 were a more the higher portion of the oncologist workforce and today it's actually the people who are over um, the age, age 64 or older who are um, higher than those under the age of 40. Now this um, map on the right here is, um, and I'm sorry that, can you guys, <laughs> this map on the right, um, we attempted to, we used information um, from the AMA master file, which is a master database of physicians in the US, and we tried to look at where oncologists are located, where they're practicing by their age. And so you'll see, you know, there's obviously a lot of population centers here, Florida, New York, et cetera. But there are some areas, um, I mean, Nevada, for instance, you know, there, of course, there isn't a lot of population here, but the fact that there's, um, that in some of these areas, let's see, the blue is like right here. Um, this is a physician who's uh, an oncologist who's over the age of 64. Look how far away the nearest dot is of someone who is under age 40 or 40 to 63. So this isn't just a sheer numbers problem, it's also a geographic distribution problem. And that's why uh, what Atul mentioned in terms of solutions, you know, the National Health Service Corps, increased reimbursement rates, things that can actually encourage physicians to go to areas where they're most needed is a, is a very important element of this system as well. Um, this is by states, um, cancer um, cases, You'll see those same places where we had a lot of physicians, there's also a lot of um, cancer cases. Uh, again, related pre predominantly to the aging of the population and where people over that age uh, live. So this um, slide, another issue that's, that's a big concern for the current workforce is burnout. Um, and there have been a lot of studies that have been done on this. 
And um, I'm just highlighting one here that Dr. Shanafelt uh, had published in the, gen uh, in the uh, JAMA Internal Medicine recently. Um, this is showing, it's comparing um, physicians to other members, other professional people in the U.S. population. And um, you'll see that there's a considerably higher, this, this column over here is the p-value, which basically if this is less than 0 0.05, it means it's significant. So this is highly significant, um, the difference between these two numbers. So not only do they have a higher burnout, they have something that's, they also have a higher level of dissatisfaction with work-life balance. And in fact, it, it wasn't in this study, but it was actually in an earlier study that we did. What is causes burnout in oncologists, you might think they're, they're dealing with a lot of death and dying and people going through life-altering experiences. And it isn't actually that. That's actually what makes them most excited and it, you know, emotionally connected to their work. What makes them burned out is, as you might imagine, the administrative work, the documentation, all of those kinds of things, hassle dealing with insurance companies. I mean, there's, I hear more and more every time I talk to an oncologist about calls they personally have to make to medical directors of insurance companies. So this is what's causing burnout. And the consequences of burnout, um, again, many studies demonstrating this, uh, that it affects professionalism, medical errors, patient satisfaction, um, and, and all of these, obviously, um, things that are going to impact not just the number of people we have, but the quality of the work that they're doing. So finally, um, from uh, what are we doing about this? In addition to um, what Atul mentioned and Alicia mentioned in terms of emphasizing the importance of GME funding, we're also looking at issues like Medicare reform, um, we're also wanting to look at how we can streamline administrative requirements and deal with some of the burnout that physicians are experiencing. And then within ASCO as a professional society, we're, incorporate, we're trying to do our best to incorporate our quality programs, our clinical decisions, provide clinical decision support through electronic health records, things like that, so the information is available to the physician right at the point of care that will help them um, make those patient encounters more valuable. And we're trying to get that all better incorporated into workflow. We're doing ongoing data collection analysis, looking at things that we can do to make practice more efficient, emphasizing team-based care. We have a lot of work that we're doing with our nursing colleagues, our physician assistant colleagues. And then finally, support services to address burnout. So this is, um, this is our, uh, my email address and our general workforce email address. Um, so if you have any questions or want, would like me to email you a copy of the slides, I'm happy to do that.